This is the Home Tech Podcast for Friday, April 30th from Sarasota, Florida. I'm Seth Johnson. Welcome to the Home Tech Podcast, the podcast all about all aspects of home technology, mostly home automation, all that good stuff. This week, we're going to dive into some home tech headlines, talk about a bunch of streaming news that came up again. I don't know. It is the season, I suppose. And uh, of course, we'll grab a pick of the week. Um, but first, uh, just a quick reminder again, as I try and do at the top of every show, don't forget about our Home Tech Talks which uh, is actually turning into a really fun thing where uh, a couple of guys get together and, and we, we chat a little bit extra about some of the news that's going on. But uh, we, we pick a topic every week. Last week, I think we did RGB lighting. Uh, we've done home theater stuff in the past. We, we, we've got topics in the hopper. Um, this week, starting up a CI business in the year 2021. So if you, uh, if you ever had any questions on how to do that, um, that this might be the one for you. <laughs> you can find out how to how to join those over at hometech.fm slash support. Uh, any any patron, any level gets you into those talks and, and where you can participate in them. You can join them. It's just a Zoom webinar. You can hop on in. We'll bring you into the conversation. Uh, or you can uh, you can jump right over. Uh, you, you can you can watch them. They're 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 there on the uh, the patron feed as well. Just hopefully all the back issues are up. I don't know. Uh, Zoom does this weird, really this really weird thing where it records in like 4K. <laughs> so for some reason, I have no idea why. It's like I don't want to transfer a 4K file, and it's 4K, but the video is still 640 resolution or even worse, 320 or something. It, it's it's horrible. I don't know why it does it. So I have to transcode everything, and it takes it takes a while. It's an hour long video. So anyway, so uh, pretty fun to check that out. Hey, check this out. Um, this week I picked up some some home technology, some kit, I guess. Uh, this is the can I put this in here? It's the Wemo Stage Smart Scene Controller. Um, it's for use with uh, Apple HomeKit. I saw saw this kind of hit uh, maybe last week or something where, where they announced that it was coming out. I jumped on their website and grabbed a couple. Uh, it, it's kind of neat. It, it lets you control. It's kind of like a Pico, I guess, maybe with less buttons, uh, but like a three-button Pico, I suppose, uh, for Apple HomeKit. And it lets you do a couple of different things like... Um, you can activate scenes, you can turn on off lights, you can really control any particular thing you can automate through Apple HomeKit with it, um, but it is limited to those three buttons. You can do, technically, you can do six different things by pressing like a long press on the button and letting go. Um, I don't know, it seems it seems all right. I'm, I, I have been promising my daughter that I would get her a button that she could reach and she'd be able to turn on and off lights um, but now she now she's tall enough to do it, so she can just like stand on her tiptoes and reach up and press the light. So maybe she doesn't need this anymore. But I was gonna program it for her and see uh, see if she she would use it to go and turn off the lights. One really neat thing about it, it it comes with like a I got one over here. It's open. It's like a backing, uh, standard Decora style backing. Uh, but you can like like just like Picos, you can glue it on the wall. It's got 3M tape on it. Um, but it's it's got like a magnet catch to it, so you can just like snap the keypad in with a magnet, pop it out when you need to use it. So it's actually designed fairly well. Like uh, Richard's actually in the, uh, in the, in the chat now uh, saying that, that uh, he's uh, he needs to try it out. Richard, I, I suggest you try it out. It's actually not bad, especially for Wemo. <laughs> and, and I don't know what it's using. It must be using Bluetooth. It can't be using Wi-Fi. Um, but it, it's, it's, it, it works really well. I was kind of surprised, uh, kind of surprised. Uh, by the build quality and everything that 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 it came in the box, it looks nice. Um, I don't think I'm going to stick on the wall or anything, but to have like a little uh, magnetic keypad that I can kind of stick, like I can stick one on the desk here, uh, in on any one of the magnetic parts or pieces or like under frames or anything like that, and have quick access to a you know a couple buttons to turn on and off lights uh, or do automation things around the house. Not not a bad thing. So check that out. Not a pick of the week yet because I really haven't flushed it out, but I thought it was pretty cool, and I had it sitting right here on the desk, so I thought I'd show you. Uh, but with that, uh, let's jump into some home tech headlines. Oh boy, blue blue sign of the blue sign of the times. <laughs> uh, home security company ADT is suing Ring, claiming its recent designs are a brazen copy of ADT's octagonal blue symbol. The firm cites Ring's blue outdoor siren uh, as a recent example. In the filing, AT ADT also lists a dozen of its trademark reg uh, registrations dating back to the late 1990s, uh, a feature of a combination of a blue, um, let's see, a blue, oct 
octagonal designs, uh, a bunch of them. If you've ever seen the ADT logo, you, you'll know what this, uh, not the logo, but so much like the uh, the little like sign that they, people put out in there, including me. I have the ADT <laughs> signs out in my yard, um, not because I use ADT, but because I just got the signs off eBay. So <laughs> like, um, I actually do monitor in my house with and, and turn it and actually use it. I turn it on and off. But the signs are just there for deterrence. They, they, they work. They do work. You don't, but you don't have to have a security system for them to work. ADT is claiming that Ring's use of the blue octagonal risks confusing customers and misleading them into thinking that the two companies are affiliated or associated. And it's a filing. ADT says, quote, the striking similarity is evidence that Ring is trying to, quote, reap and benefit the goodwill associated with ADT's brand and reputation. It adds, this type of confusion is seriously undermines the goodwill that ADT has cultivated in its famous blue octagon. Those are capital, each one of those, famous blue octagon, okay? Like that's a thing. And irreparably harms ADT. Uh, and here's a quote I thought was funny from the lawsuit itself. Ring believes that when the public sees the solid blue octagon on a home, they will think of ADT. Uh, completely ignoring the fact that they just can't read the actual three or four letters that are on the octagon. Uh, I don't know. So back in 2016, there was a, a spit about this as well, uh, where Ring would, um, they, they came out with like a, their little signs and stickers and everything that you could get with their security box, uh, security systems and, and cameras and that kind of thing. Uh, and ADT said something about it then, and the Ring's solution was to make it less blue. Um, and, and ADT didn't really do anything after that. They just kind of dropped the issue. Uh, but now it seems that, I don't know. This seems like a, a bit of desperation from ADT to get some press or some money or a settlement or something. I'm not sure. I really don't think the two brands are particularly harmed. Um, I was talking to my wife about this and she said, why would anybody do that? It looks just like, you know, this does look just like ADT. But it, from my perspective, it was, it was kind of interesting to hear that perspective. From my perspective, working in the security industry for, geez, like 20 years, um, I mean, half the companies out there had these blue stop sign things or, or not. They weren't blue because they, quite frankly, they didn't want to be associated with ADT, so they didn't make them blue. Uh, but there's plenty of security companies, just regular local security companies that have that octagon. In fact, you can go on to you can go into any, any website, basically, and uh, and get get if you have a security company or if you just want to buy some, uh, you can actually get them. In fact, I thought about, you know, doing this. If you, if anybody wants me to make this product here, I, I'm going to do this. This looks really cool. I have a blue octagon uh, that, that I, I'm going to make and, and stick in front of my house. And it says listening to the Home Tech Podcast and has hometech.fm on it. So let me zoom in there so you guys in the chat can see that. Look at that bad boy. There you go. So I, I think we should make that and, and stick it in front of all, all of our houses. And it may help people find the podcast. So you, <laughs> it's going to be our show art this week for sure. So we'll we'll, um, we'll get that in. Hopefully ADT won't sue us, but I don't think they will. I think we're a little bit below the radar there. All right. In October 2020, Heinz Heiss Online, a German electronics magazine, basically, uh, published a report concluding that HDMI 2.1 chip being rolled out in receivers from Denon, Marantz, and Yamaha is faulty by design. It results in a black screen for most 4K 120 and 8K 60 signals. Um, and that... And it may not be fixable by firmware. Six months later, the HDMI 2.1 issue persists, and it seems like the the companies are throwing in the towel. Sound, Sound United is now offering owners an adapter kit, which is a completely you know other box. Uh, it, it's given up on trying to like fix it with software. Uh, so if you've got basically here's a here's a quote from one of their support articles: If you experience a black screen and no audio when trying to pass through a 4K 120 or 8K signals from a gaming device connected to the 8K input of the Denon AV receiver. This adapter will help you get a proper gaming experience. Yamaha has also acknowledged the issue and it's recommending owners use HDMI eARC as a solution. So um, basically going directly to the TV and then coming back with audio from the TV uh, for, for gaming and just kind of bypassing the receiver altogether. That doesn't sound too good. Uh, just kind of putting this out there for anybody running across this weird issue. Uh, this, yeah, as Craig is pointing out in the in the chat, this is this is great press for uh, AK. Yeah, it's not looking too hot. Um, I guess there's not too much out there doing AK right now. So PS5 has it, and the Xbox Series X may have it as well. Um, but there really can't be that much 
content out there for it, much less the the TV sets to display it. You know, at the moment, I I suppose this stuff's getting more popular, um, but it, it seems like this is this is early days, and um, it seems like early adopters always get stuck uh, running into these kind of issues. Oh boy, another one. A Roku on Monday notifies its users uh, by email that YouTube TV may be forced off its platform entirely, alleging the anti-competitive demands from Google included requests for preferential treatment, uh, preferential treatment of its YouTube TV and YouTube apps. Roku says it's not asking for more money, but for better terms around anti-competitive demands from Google, such as being asked to favor Google products in the Roku search results. Roku also claims that Google is demanding that Roku make their hardware a little bit better to meet Google specs, a move that could possibly increase the price of their products. Uh, for their part, Google says they're just trying to work out a deal with Roku and that Roku claims are baseless. Here's a quote from their response. All of our work with them has been focused on ensuring high quality and consistent experience with our viewers. We have had no requests to access user data or interfere with search results. Uh, we hope we can resolve this for the sake of our mutual users. So, um, fun. It seems like carriage disputes are now for cord cutters. <laughs> like we, we've seen this in the past when it comes to like uh, satellite dish company, I think Dish Network and like Fox Sports always had you know, those those spouts where you would potentially lose, uh, you know, uh, you see it pop up like during baseball season or basketball season. You don't lose the next game, you know, contact direct TV now or vice versa. You know, they, they would, they would each put up their own advertisements. And I don't, I don't really know who, if that ever works, but you know, who knows? Like in this case, like either one of these companies, who do you call? Like, who do you call at Google to complain? <laughs> like, it's not like, uh, do you just send someone an email and say, please don't turn off my YouTube TV on my Roku, you know, just give in and, I, I really don't know how this works in the age of digital companies that have no support services, but here we are. Carriage disputes have made it into the digital age. All right, HBO Max is getting ready uh, to uh, to bring in live hockey. So the streaming news continues here. <laughs> Thanks to a seven-year deal between the National Hockey League and Warner Media's Turner Sports. Uh, alongside HBO Max stepping into sports spotlight, Turner Sports has also announced that TNT and TBS will air the Stanley Cup three out of the seven years outlined in the deal. So 2023, 25, and 27. And the remaining years will be hosted on ESPN Plus and ABC. Just to kind of give you a, uh, a price breakdown here, let's see. ESPN Plus costs $6 a month or $14 a month with bundled with uh, Disney Plus or Hulu. HBO costs $15 a month, so kind of on par there. Uh, NHL TV it costs thirty five dollars for the all access pass, or you can just do one team, all, all of one team games for uh, thirty dollars a month. Um, so good news there for hockey fans. Uh, HBO Max really isn't HBO in general is not really known for sports, and you know outside of like the documentary, a couple of documentaries that they have out there. Um, but we're seeing all of these streaming services start to expand. Uh, what they offer, their offerings, and, and, and broaden their scope um, to help attract more customers and keep the people they have subscribed. I mean, there's there's no there's no uh, like you're not you're not forced to stay on AT and T. You're not forced to stay on uh, HBO Max. You can cancel every month. But if they can keep you around, if they can bring in the hockey game, here it is, hockey game, yeah, Stanley Cup champs right there. Um, then uh, then yeah. They, they, they will they will do what they can to keep you year round. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, Spotify is increasing the price of many its subscriptions this week across the UK and parts of Europe with a little bit here uh, in the US for family plans. Subscribers to the service have started to receive emails informing them of the changes and they will affect the student, the duo and family plans across most Europe and the UK and other markets as well. Um, and this is all starting on April 30th. Uh, so here's here's kind of the breakdown. Spotify family is increasing a whole dollar from 15 to 16 dollars per month in the US. And so over the UK, Spotify student is increasing from five to six sorry pounds per month. Uh, and the duo, which is a subscription for two people moving from 13 pounds to 14 pounds a month. And uh, UK Spotify family is going to go up uh, two pounds actually from 15 to 17 a month. So 
Uh, kind of interesting to see that Spotify's price increases come just months after the company revealed that it has more than 150 million subscribers. That's huge. Um, despite this, they still had a loss of 125 million euro uh, in the recent quarter. So we're probably going to see uh, kind of there's an earning call, uh, I think, tomorrow, uh, Thursday, as we record this on two, on Wednesday. Earnings call will be tomorrow. So we'll probably find out a little bit more on uh, on why they, they raised these rates then. We have to keep an eye on that one. Netflix is finally rolling out a feature called Play Something on TV devices with support coming to mobile soon. Uh, Netflix has been running this the test on this uh, since last year. And the idea behind this is, well, you don't know what to watch and you get tired of scrolling endlessly through their lists of shows. Yeah, here, you just open up the Netflix app. You see the button that says play something. You click it, you're watching something. Who knows? Uh, it, it's, gonna, it's not completely random. It's just going to give you something that Netflix thinks you want to see. Um, but you also have an option to kind of like skip something by clicking none other than the play something else button. Uh, if, if that option doesn't bring up that you something that you want to see. So um, there also be a 10th row on the homepage. Um, so you can scroll down and kind of look through that uh, to see if anything appeals to you in that list. So again, uh, the streaming services are, are trying to figure out how to keep you on their, on their site and, um, and, and watching things. I've actually had this problem recently with Netflix. Um, there's, there's really not much to watch on there right now. And, uh, I, you know, pandemic is kind of catching up with us and uh, in our in our viewing habits. Um, I'm not finding much that I want to see right now. So I'm kind of switching back over to movies and, and watching a lot of older movies um, that I that I either missed or didn't see uh, in the past. But I don't know. I'm just I'm not there's not much on Netflix right now that that I find compelling. at least at least what they're suggesting. There could be something hidden away and maybe this random watch button that they have um, might get me in the ballpark a little bit better. All right, big news from Sony. Uh, Sony's new line of Bravia XR television sets will allow customers to watch and stream movies at some of the highest quality available in consumer market through its new Bravia Core platform. This is all according to Sony. Uh, the Bravia XR owners will be able to choose from a number of Sony picture titles and watch them using Sony's Pure Stream technology, which uh, achieves near lossless, ultra-high definition, Blu-ray disc quality, according to Sony. Uh, Pure Stream also allows for streaming up to 80 megabits per second, which if you compare to the other streaming services out there, somewhere between uh, 15 and 25 megabits per second uh, to, to achieve uh, 4K Ultra HD streaming quality. So this is uh, huge numbers from Sony and uh, probably going to <laughs> wipe out your uh, data caps. At least they would on mine <laughs> if you watch too many uh, Sony movies. So um, I don't I don't think this is this is something that's going to replace Netflix or HBO anytime soon. Uh, it's just Sony catalog some some of the movies in Sony's catalog, but it should I I think this is this is more of a play on just to show what the TV could do. Um, this is this is something that uh, it's kind of like it's kind of like you 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 buy a sports car and you only drive it around town. Well. Sony's Sony's giving you the the, uh, the track here, and they're they're letting you take a little test drive on the track uh, to to see what the uh, the TV could do. So we'll we'll it will be interesting to see uh, what all kind of goes into this um, and, and how how many people uh, use this service. I don't I don't think it's going to be too popular, but again, it's just a couple of Sony titles and uh, kind of their own streaming thing. But being in this super high definition Blu-ray quality. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's gonna wipe out. It's gonna wipe out your internet pretty quickly. <laughs> and I, I have a bit of a follow up on the uh, projector caliber. So sorry, the calibration that we talked about last week for the Apple, the new Apple TV. It's not only on the new Apple TV. It's only all the old Apple TVs too. So if you have a 4K or an HD, um, you can actually run the calibration uh, using your updated phone and updated Apple TV. And uh, here's, here's actually, I have a video of me kind of going through this here. Let's see if I can bring that up. There we go. So this is my my awesome projector, uh, pr projection. This is my theater in my garage. You can see my garage there. Um, but what, what there's, a, there's I ran across a tip and a trick that you can actually wrap uh, like parchment paper around your phone and stick it up there in the blue dot facing the projector. And what it'll do is it'll pick up the light. Now, 
I, I'm not very smart. And I realized that like, I thought that I had turned off my phone, but no, what the phone, this phone screen will turn off when it detects light being shine, shined at the camera. So just make sure that you wrap up the, uh, the uh, parchment paper there pretty tightly around it. So it gets a nice clean image there. Uh, you can see that it kind of goes through. It's, um, it's a little red, green, blue color swatches. The white does its thing. Uh, it does white a couple of times. It does a different, like a white and then like an off-white, a little lower white, maybe maybe three or four times. And then boom, uh, there you go. Color balance complete, uh, which is kind of cool, I thought. Um, you could actually, you know, here, here's actually on my horrible projector screen, <laughs> the difference between original and balanced. And I did notice a difference. So there is something there. Uh, but it just goes to show that this feature that all I only thought would only work on TVs on the latest newest Sony, uh, Sony, uh, sorry, not Sony, uh, Apple TVs, uh, works on the older Apple TVs. And, uh, there you go. Do you, <laughs> Greg says, do you have to provide the values of the parchment paper to compensate? I, I have no idea, Greg. I think what they're just doing is, is getting in the ballpark and, uh, w with, with the light that's coming off the colors there. Uh, it, it, and it's, it's the colors that come from your TV, right? So like, it, it's not, it's not, it's, they're just, they're just looking at the, the, the levels of those colors that are coming off. So my, my screen is white. The parchment paper is roughly white too. And I think that they are just taking that Lux map and basically applying it back onto, um, back onto the picture and, and, and just identifying what levels they're going to send out at what, um, at what speed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can use whatever paper you want, toilet paper, tissue paper. I think it'd probably work as long as it, the light shone through it a little bit. So, um, Greg's asking if you can, uh, if you can tell if there's a difference or is it any better? Um, not on my horrible projector. <laughs> I can't tell. I did it on my 4k TV inside and I did notice that the color levels were better. Um, and, and I had ballparked that with a THX app as well. So, um, that I did notice that, that, that it had gotten a little bit closer, like skin tones looked a little bit better. I, I was, it looked like I was off on maybe the reds, um, from when, when you toggle back and forth, but only so much, it wasn't, it wasn't really, uh, wasn't really that much. So, um, anyway, a really cool feature. It gets you in the ballpark. It, 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 it and it shows off more of what your TV can do. I think for getting getting this kind of technology into more people's hands and at least having more people go through that process, uh, maybe getting a, a, a better picture, essentially, out of the TV um, is good for everybody. I mean, it, it's going to, you know, the rising tide raises all ships. I, I think it's going to be a, a a great idea uh, for that. So <laughs> there's there's definitely some uh, some questions about what two ply toilet paper. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know, guys, you, you guys... <laughs> Can, can try whatever you want. I used parchment paper because uh, I found a little thread on Twitter that said it worked, and sure enough, it did. So uh, uh, check out the video there uh, on our, our links as well. Um, all the links and topics we discussed tonight can be found on the show notes at hometech.fm slash 349. Wow, almost to 350. Um, if you want to join the show, you can join us live in the chat. Like, five or six people. Wow. There's, there's a lot of people here tonight. <laughs> Not usually this many, uh, starting sometimes on Wednesday between seven and seven thirty PM Eastern. You can find out more on how to do that at hometech.fm slash live. Uh, anybody who listens to other podcasts like uh resi week may know my position on vinyl and how I don't think it's very good at all, but here is uh, how you can listen to some really old digitized vinyls. Uh, this is the Inter Internet Archive digitizing 78 RPM records um, from, wow, the late 1800s all the way up to like 19, the 1950s. Um, that, that was how music was recorded. I mean, there's a couple like Edison cartridges that you can get, um, but most everything was pressed into vinyl and uh, on these 78s. Um, so they're, they're, they're working to digitize over 250,000 <clears throat> records. Or they, they've actually done that for 250,000 records. They preserved them and then uh, archived them. And they, they actually run them through Isotope RX-7 to clean them up. Uh, so if you go and, and, and browse the Internet Archive and see all of these, um, see all these uh, albums that they've, they've digitized, you can actually um, 
pick a restored version of the song, which is really cool. Um, and they, they go to great lengths to get a decent recording off of this, uh, off these records. Um, you can see here in the video that, the, that they, they released that there's, they're, they're cleaning, they go through and clean the records off. They vacuum the channels out with the little vacuum thing. Um, they photograph, they categorize all of them. And then uh, they actually have this really cool custom rig that'll come up here in a second um, that has four, uh, has, it's like a record player, but it has four cartridges on it. Uh, and, you know, people in their cartridges, they, they think, um, <laughs> they think one is better than the other. There it is. There it is. That's really cool. Um, so this custom built turntable, they put it on, you got four cartridges, each one of them reads it in. And when you're looking through the archive, you can actually listen to each one of these cartridges, but in two different ways, you can listen to it EQ'd and you can listen to it just raw, um, if you wanted to. So, uh, from, from a technology standpoint, what they're doing is just absolutely stunning. And um, I, I can't believe how much they're able to do here. This, this is really cool. It's a partnership with George Blood LP, and they've been working since 2016 to digitize thousands of these 78 RPM records. So um, check that out. I, I will put a link there in the show, not, show notes to the Internet Archive and, and the, the, the thread that they have on Twitter uh, where, where they uh, kind of go over all of the steps that they make uh, and all the stuff that they've done to digitize these early recordings. So... It is really, really cool. Um, and w what I haven't found, and I, I didn't have much time to dig, um, was a way to like listen to these just live. Like you could just press play on them. I, I don't know if there's like a, a like a radio station or, or like where they stream out. And it may just be that they don't have money to do that. I don't know. Um, but it'd be really cool to just kind of like hit play and listen to old, um, you know, folk music recordings from the early, early, early 1900s. Um, some of that music could just be lost to time if not for these recordings. So it's really cool that they, they've done this. If you have any feedback, questions, comments, picks of the week, or great ideas for the show, give us a shout. Email address is feedback at hometech.fm, or you can visit hometech.fm slash feedback. Fill out the online form. And I do want to end the show. Uh, we want to give a big thank you to everyone who supports the show, but especially those who are able to financially support the, through the Patreon page. If you don't know about our Patreon page, head on over to hometech.fm slash support to learn how you can support Home Tech for as little as a dollar a month. Any pledge over five bucks a month gets you a big shout out on the show, but every pledge gets you an invite to our private Slack chat at the hub where you and other supporters of the show can gather there every day to talk about, oh, what have we been talking about? We talked about Winamp. Winamp, we, as, I, as I ran into that, uh, <laughs> the, the, the Internet Archive actually has a, a web-based Winamp that is scary scary i didn't have like the visualization plugins but i i hit the little llama button and uh <laughs> greg's asking there in the chat yeah what about the llamas uh the, i hit the button and 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 man it was just like i was trans transported back uh into the i don't know late 1990s early 2000s Win winamp was such a great program for playing mp3s and uh just extremely i mean extremely well written it, it would never crashed i never had a problem at all with winamp um but man what, what it was really it was just weird seeing that on the web page and they have a, they have a web-based version of it that you can go through and play these songs on it's really cool so uh yeah check that out and uh, if you want to help out the show but can't support the show financially no problem we appreciate a five-star review on itunes or positive rating in the podcast app of your choice and with that that wraps up uh Another week of home technology news uh, here. Thanks everybody for for uh, joining us here in the in the chat live chat. It's been lively tonight. Really appreciate that. Um, we we've got uh, home tech talks coming up tomorrow um, around three o'clock Eastern. Uh, and if you want to join that, head on over to the patron page and uh, and use the link to sign up for that. Um, but I, I think this one's going to be pretty fun um, to talk about what it takes to start a, a CI business. Uh, in the year 2021, do you, do you even need to be a CI? Can you just hang TVs for a living? I bet, I bet that's probably a pretty good, uh, <laughs> pretty good thing. But, uh, there, there's been a couple of conversations floating around the hub about, you know, when do you start your business? At, at what point does the, the hobby become your full-time gig and, and how do you make that transition? And, um, you know, there's a lot of different answers, uh, and, and, and to that and a, a lot of different advice that I just that was popping up in there and I thought was too good we, we just we've got to capture it for one of our talks so if you're interested in that join us tomorrow um, it will be recorded and I'll try and get it up um, posted back up if it doesn't record in 8k because uh, my my receiver won't 
the code AK120 or whatever. Uh, so <laughs> I'll, hopefully I'll figure out why uh, uh, Zoom is doing doing that and, uh, and, and fix it a little bit better. But with that, uh, everybody, have a great weekend. Thanks for joining the chat, and we'll chat with you next week. Bye.